The last time I was here was uh, two years ago. I was skipped last year because of the uh, COVID lockdown, so it's a bit unsettling. But uh, before I start, I'd just like to uh, express my gratitude to Pastor Jerry, the rest of the uh, pastoral staff, the leaders, and uh, our friends and family for showing us care and love uh, when we were sick the beginning of the year. Uh, now I know why God wanted us to join a local church. It's certainly a safe port whenever there's uh, storms in your lives. Amen. So uh, let's start with our sermon. Um, I'm um, going to uh, talk about uh, the books of Samuel 1 and 2 and uh, Jesus as the seed of David. So who here has heard of the musical called Hamilton. Have you heard of that? Yeah? Yeah? So it opened with critical acclaim and was sold out for several months. That was back in 2015. It won almost all of the theater and literary awards at that time, including 11 Tonys, the Drama Desk, Pulitzer Prize for Drama, and even the Olivier Award when it opened across the pond in London. Last year, it came out on streaming, and uh, as a result of that, it won Emmys uh, at the beginning of the year. It is the story of the American founding fathers and their struggle to establish a nation. And my favorite character in the play is uh, King George III. He was the king of England, and of course, him and his army were the protagonists in the story uh, in the beginning of the play. Uh, he was made into a comic relief, uh, but I find him witty, and uh, he almost always steals the show whenever he comes out. And he has a song there where he talks to the American people to give his sentiment on the rebellion that, that, that was happening. And so, still talking as the king of the colonies, he gave this advice. Cause when push comes to shove, I will kill your friends and family to remind you of my love. I'm sorry, there's no more cantata, so uh, I have to take my opportunity everywhere. No, 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 no. Once you're familiar with the song, um, you know, uh, it always comes out as, as, as a song. So again, let's, let's look at that, and uh, maybe you can look, we can see it in the uh, slides. It says, cause when push comes to shove, I will kill your friends and family to remind you of my love. So how crazy is that? That's so twisted, right? So that's a good illustration of the problem with the monarchical form of government where um, only one person is the leader, which is the king. He exercises total power and influence, and the people exist for their pleasure. They are not ruling to serve the people. This morning, we will be talking about a different kind of king, a king instituted by God himself through a covenant, and a king that will serve his children, his people, and accomplish God's purpose for our world. We will read our verse later when it's, it's closer to where we're going to talk about the content of the uh, covenant of David and God. So first, let's pray. Our most gracious and loving God, Lord, thank you, Lord, for giving this opportunity, Lord, for me. Uh, may I, as I do my sermon, Lord, may you Make my presence, Lord, smaller and smaller, Lord, and your presence bigger and bigger. May you, may I be able to relay, uh, Lord, your message for your congregation today and uh, open our, our hearts and minds. All of this, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So first, we will be talking about the context of the covenant, the events that paved the way for the establishment of the covenant of God with David. And uh, we are continuing with our year-long journey of discovering Christ in all the books of the Bible. 
And this morning, as I said, we will be looking at the two books of Samuel. Due to the limitation of the time, we will just go through the main themes and events. And sometimes it will seem like I'm going through the events very quickly, uh, since a lot of things have happened in these books. But it's an exciting pair of books, and I invite you to read them whenever you get the chance. So for the background, we have been talking the past two weeks that uh, the Lord had provided judges for the Israelites to act as God's messengers, to act as leaders, to settle disputes, and commanders in battles when, uh, against the other tribes, against the other nations. Samuel was the prophet used by God to transition from judges to kings. So let me introduce to you uh, Samuel, uh, who's, um, who, whose name um, is the uh, title of those two books. Samuel's mother was called Hannah, very beautiful name. I recommend that if you have a daughter, you name her Hannah. Just, just, just kidding, my daughter's name is Hannah. So Samuel's mother was called Hannah, who vowed to God that if ever she had a son, he will be dedicated as a Nazarite. A Nazarite is someone who voluntarily takes a vow of consecration, like Sam Samson. He didn't cut his hair as uh, his vow of consecration. So Samuel, as a kid, he was brought to Eli, who was one of the last judges in the Old Testament to serve at the shrine of Shiloh, where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. And Simon's blessing of prophecy was recognized when he was made to relay the wickedness of the sons of Eli and the impending end of Eli's rule. So it happened like this. One night he was about to sleep and uh, he heard some voices and uh, he thought it was Eli who's uh, talking to him. So he went to Eli, asked him what he was saying, and uh, Eli recognized that it may be God who wanted to talk to Samuel. So uh, Eli asked him to just listen, and he did. So the next day, Eli asked him what the message was, and of course, it's not good news for Eli, so it's, he was hesitant to tell him, but uh, Eli was adamant, so Samuel relayed that... Uh, you know, his rule and his sons will die. And Eli accepted that the Lord should do what's right to him. So when, when all of Israel heard of this story, it established the reputation of Samuel as a prophet. So that's Samuel. So one of the things that happened to pave the way for the... Uh, for, um, the covenant between God and David is the loss of the Ark of the Covenant. And the covenant that's referred here is the covenant between God and Moses and the Israel nation. So in the Old Testament, perhaps there's no religious artifact more important than the Ark of the Covenant. It was created as per the Lord's instructions to Moses to house the two uh, tablets of the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod, and a pot of manna. It accompanied the Israelites in their wanderings in the desert and uh, for these previously enslaved people who's just rebuilding their relationship with God. It served as the only physical manifestation of Yahweh on earth. And the Ark of the Covenant was also instrumental in the major battles to claim their promised land. One is led by Joshua at the banks of Jordan River. It was used to signal the advance of the people. The river grew dry as soon as the feet of the priests carrying the Ark touched the waters, and it remained dry until the Ark left the river after all of the people has, had passed. Also in the Battle of Jericho, I think this was also uh, illustrated by Pastor Jerry when he was talking about uh, the book of uh, jo Joshua. Yeah, right. In the Battle of Jericho, the ark was carried around the city once a day for six days. 
uh, with armed men and seven priests. And on the seventh day, they again went around the uh, city of uh, Jericho. And uh, after going around seven times, they had a great shout, and Jericho's walls fell down. And so the Israelites were able to take the city. So this gives us an idea of how important and dear the ark was to these people. In the fourth chapter of 1 Samuel, we will see the sons of Eli decide, decided to take the ark into another battle. The reasoning was, just like Jericho and the Jordan River, the ark will assure them of victory. But they were heavily defeated, and the ark was captured by the Philistines. So what went wrong? Why didn't God provide them the victory? Well, I have... Uh, Two reasons for that. One is they were wrong in their attempt to manipulate God. They thought because the ark was also important to God, he will automatically give Israel the victory. You know, surely God will not let the ark be taken in defeat. But that's using human logic. And we have to be careful whenever we're using human logic. Here are two verses that warns us against using human logic to try to manipulate God. Um, we'll see in Proverbs 14, verse 12, it says, There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. So our human logic is limited. Sometimes we think that uh, if we do this, uh, the thing one way, um, it would be right, but it, it may lead to disaster in the end. The second one is Isaiah 55, 8 to 9. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So I, what I want to show here is uh, our human logic is limited compared to the thoughts of God. And uh, if we try to second-guess God or try to manipulate Him, you know, that, that wouldn't work. It'll lead to destruction. And you may say, surely I will never manipulate God. But have you had the chance, uh, sometimes you've done, you've done something for God, so He will honor a request. For example, you'll say, I'll go to church today so God will help me in my exam or my work next week. Or another example is, I will give extra today so God will bless me with a car I want or for the ladies, I guess, with a bag I want. So those are just examples. <laughs> so those are just examples of ways people try to manipulate God. Another reason why the Israelites didn't uh, get their victory is they put their trust on things and not God. It will not be the ark who, who will give them victory. It will be the Lord if that was his intent. What the Lord wants us to do is to trust and obey him. Then he will give us victory. And we'll see that in Psalms 37, 5 to 6, it says, Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. So all we have to do is trust and obey him, and he will give us his reward. We don't have to do any manipulation. Amen? Amen. All right. So as a last note, the, uh, I, I said that the, last, the ark was captured by the Philistines, but that didn't mean that the Lord was defeated. Because everywhere the Philistine brought the Ark of the Covenant, disaster happened on that land. So another thing, another theme, uh, important theme in the books of Samuel is kingship. It is in Samuel where Israel demanded that they be given a king instead of the judges the Lord had been providing them as leaders. So what is the difference between a judge and a king? Why was Israel adamant in getting a king instead of continuing to have judges? 
if we look at the roles, there was not much difference. Both kings and judges will lead Israel against their enemies and maintain a judicial system for the nation. The difference lies on who really would be leading Israel. If we look at Isaiah 44, 6, it says, This is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. So the first two lines there um, are the introduction of, of uh, the speaker. It says, this is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. So what we see there, uh, that the Lord was given a title of Israel's King and Redeemer. So in the Old Testament, God wants to be the King. God wants to be the Redeemer of the Israel nation. He set the Jewish nation apart as kingdom of priests and a holy nation and considered them his treasured possession in Exodus 19. So as a favored nation, God himself, the plan of God will be God himself will lead Israel, but it's through the judges. Let's contrast that to the motivation of Israel when they were asking for a king. If you look at 1 Samuel Chapter 8, verse 5, it says, They said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. So these are the uh, people talking to Samuel, trying to uh, let them have a king. And it says on the last part of uh, that verse, Such as all the other nations have. So they wanted to have a king because the other, that's what the other nations had it. All the while, there were this holy nation there was, um, who's being favored by God, who, who's uh, being led by God. So they'd rather have a human king than the Lord leading them. And, uh, and the reason was because that's how the other nations had it. So it's like, you know, you're, you're given this Giardelli chocolate and you said, I don't want it, I want the M&Ms. So you had it really good, but you'd rather have the uh, inferior product because that's how the others have it. So what about us? Practical application. Are we more concerned with being like others rather than following what the Lord wants us to do? An example may be, are we more concerned with being part of popular movements or popular fads without considering if they are in line with God's law? Have we considered if their purpose aligns to the all-encompassing directive of God to love other people and share the gospel. So let us not lose sight of God just because of our desire to be like the other people. Amen. So back to our story. So God took the people's request as a rejection. And what we'll see on 1 Samuel 8-7, to he told Samuel, It is not you who they have rejected, but they have rejected me as king. So they... God knows that they have rejected him as their king. And the Lord still tried to warn the people what will happen if they have a human king. But the people are still adamant to have one. So God allowed them to select Saul as their first king. And the Bible will later tell us that the Lord's warning came to pass and Saul was such a disaster as a king. So sometimes... The Lord allows our request, even if it's not the best for us, because of our hard-headedness. I guess sometimes we want to learn the, our lessons the hard way. So let's pray for proper discernment when it comes to our request for God. So that's the context. Now let's look at the conception of the covenant, what I want to 
What I mean here is the immediate happenings that brought about the uh, covenant between David and God. So Israel's second king, in contrast to Saul, was anointed by God. Unlike Saul, who stands as the most charismatic person in a group, David did not even stand out amongst his brothers when Samuel asked Jesse to show his sons. The story, the background story was uh, Samuel was asked by God to go to Jesse's house because the next king would come from Jesse's son. So he went there, um, and Jesse showed all of his sons. And if not for God reminding Samuel to look at the heart instead of the physical appearance, he wouldn't have recognized David as the next king because he was just a lowly shepherd at that time. So um, to make the long story short, Samuel anointed David, a lowly shepherd, to be the next king after Saul. So you may be asking, if God did not want Israel to be led by a king, why did he anoint the successor to the first king? Well, the answer for this is it was always God's intent to give Israel a king. But uh, people's motivation back then when they were asking for the king was not right, and the timing was premature when they asked for a king. And uh, I can prove that if we look at the, even the first book of the Bible in Genesis, we'll see in the promise uh, of God to Abraham, it says, I will make you very fruitful, I will make nations of you, and kings will come after you. So it has always been the plan of God to also give Israel a king. Also in Deuteronomy, so that's the uh, fifth book in the Bible, still part of the Pentateuch early on. It says, when you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us, be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your fellow Israelites. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not, on, not an Israelite. So even then, God already knows what the nation of Israel will do. But one thing that the Lord uh, pointed out to them, made sure that they follow, which they didn't, is on verse 15, to be sure to appoint over you a king that the Lord your God chooses. What happened back then with Saul was the, it was selected by the people and not by the Lord. So David is the, was the first king the Lord himself cho- have chosen. And he ushered in what was recognized by historian as God, the golden age of Israel. He unified all of the tribes of Israel. He defeated external enemies and crushed the Philistines. And we will not even add the story of Goliath since, you know, that happened before David became king. He also recovered the Ark of the Covenant and made made Jerusalem the capital of the nation. David was an accomplished musician and poet. In fact, he wrote most of the Psalms, where we will see his love for the Lord and his struggles as a king and a follower of God. His devotion and passion to obey God also was so evident that Samuel commended him as a man after God's own heart. That's in Samuel 13, 14. So did that mean that David did not sin? The answer is negative. And you know the story of Bathsheba, right? Who David had an adulterous relationship with. And to fix the situation, what David did was he sent Bathsheba's husband to the front lines to ensure that he will be killed. Um, So did his sins, did his adultery, did his murder disqualify him to be used by God? The answer is a qualified no. As long as we honestly repent our sins, the Lord will forgive us and the Lord will still use us for his purpose. And we can continue to have a relationship with him. 
This is what's called God's grace, and it is Him who chose to grant it to us. We did not earn it due to what we have done or how perfect we are, because uh, as a human in this world, that would be impossible. So that brings us to God's covenant with David, which is also known as the Davidic covenant. But before we go to the contents, let's first understand what is a covenant. In an article in Christianity.com, uh, they uh, mentioned that the covenant, the word covenant came from the Hebrew word berith, which means a cutting. So how would a covenant be derived from something being cut? It turns out that in Hebrew tradi tradition, covenants are ratified between two parties by cutting an animal into two. The idea was if one of the parties reneged, they would expect to share the fate of the animal. So, ouch. So it is an agreement more solemn and more serious than a basic promise. And if it is coming from God, as did the uh, Davidic covenant, we can definitely guarantee that it will come to pass. So as I said, the covenant was recovered by David from the Philistines. So Israel brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem with much fanfare and thanksgiving to God. But later on that same day, David lamented because while he was living in a house of cedar, the Ark of the Covenant was just in a tent. And as a response to the Lord, uh, the Lord made a covenant with King David the contents of which are shown by our verses for today. So let's rise. We will at last read our verse for the day. Let's rise where we are reading from his word. It's found on 2 Samuel 7, 11 to 16. It says, The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will be, build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. You may be seated. So now, as our third part, let's talk about the con contents of the covenant. Uh, the first part talks about uh, his son who will build the temple. So in verses uh, 11 and 12, God promised David that his kingdom will be maintained and he will be succeeded by his son. And that son turned out to be Solomon. It will be his son who will build the, the Lord's temple and not him. And it will be later revealed in Chronicles. Uh, the reason why the Lord chose that, it was because David had shed much blood and he fought on many wars. The Lord wanted a man of peace. To build his temple. And uh, on verse 14, uh, we will also see a warning to the descendants of David, who would be the future king of Israel. It says, uh, the Lord will continue the father-son relationship with Solomon and the other descendants of David. And of course, by extension, God will also have a close relationship with the nation of Israel. That would mean that the Lord will richly provide and protect the nation if they follow their decrees. But what's added on verse 14 was that he would use other men to discipline David's descendants and Israel if they do wrong. Again, I'll remind you, it says, I will punish him with a rod wielded by man, with floggings inflicted by human hands. Sadly, Israel and their kings chose to disobey God. 
And what resulted was God used other nations to conquer and even exile Israel. But we will still, still see God's grace when he's disciplining Israel because of unfaithfulness. We'll see in verse 15, um, it was affirmed that his love will never leave them. And that was what happened. God was always ready to rescue and rebuild Israel whenever they repented. So that's the first part. The second part of the uh, um, covenant was the promise of a future king who would rule forever. What's most significant in the last part of this covenant with the Lord is, is the Lord's use of the word forever. On verse 13, we will see, he said, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. On verse 16, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So I guess there's still a forever. So, <laughs> so this was made the basis for the Jewish nation to expect a Messiah and a future king from the line of David to come and save them from their predicaments. If God promised David's kingdom will last forever, then someone will come and retake the throne. And this indeed came to pass with the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we look at Luke 1, when the angel appeared to Mary when she was troubled with the news that she was with a son, the angel reassured her. Uh, let's read Luke 1, 30 to 33. It says, But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever, his kingdom will never end. So the word forever is still there. So in verse 32, what we uh, will see in verse 32, it says the father will give Jesus the throne of his earthly ancestor, King David. So Jesus is the culmination of the Davidic covenant. And if you still, still need some persuasion aside from this verse, let's Look at the genealogy of Jesus and how he connects to King David. Luke traced it in the third chapter of his gospel. Is it big enough? Yeah. So in the middle, you know, it, it Luke, I guess, traced it from God, from Abraham down to Jesus. But in the middle, uh, around the middle, you'll see Jesse, then David, then all the way down to Jesus Christ. So... Um, You'll also recognize that the trace is through Joseph and the male hierarchy, and that's because Israel's tradition in terms of ruling is patriarchal. Um, this, you know, shows that the charge Israel leveled on Jesus when uh, they brought him to Pilate, that he blasphemed by saying he is king of the Jews, that has no basis because indeed, Jesus is the rightful king of the Jews. So you'll say, you know, this happened more than 2,000 years ago. How can Jesus still be reigning as king? Well, Jesus' resurrection, because of Jesus' resurrection, he is still actively reigning as king. And verse 16 of the covenant is true. Jesus' house and kingdom will endure forever and his throne is established forever. In addition, if you look at March 16, verse 19, we'll see that his current throne is right beside God. Um, if we show Mark 16, verse 19 on the slide, well, if you can see it, it'll say, after the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. So Jesus is still reigning as the king of the Jews. But you may ask, is he also the king for the rest of us, Gentiles? 
Well, this was discussed by John Piper in one of his sermons. And he said, the reason for the Davidic covenant is relevant for the 20th century American Gentiles, which is us, is because God's job description, that just means what God said he will do, which he revealed to David included not just the responsibility to establish a righteous ruler in Israel forever, but also to put that ruler over the church, which is the universal church we're a part of, and then all over the world. So what he's saying that the Davidic covenant also includes us, not just the Jews. And he backed it up by offering these following points. The first point is, you know, this question had been discussed not just right now, even back in the Bible in Acts they were all already discussing about if the Gentiles are covered by the gospel. And they had a Jerusalem council in Acts 15. And so they talked about if, you know, this question. And one of the things that one of the people who spoke out was Peter. And he related how the Gentiles received the Holy Spirit just like the Jews. So he's coming up as a witness that Gentiles also can receive the Holy Spirit. Paul and Barnabas also spoke out, and they mentioned their success amongst the Gentiles. And then Peter related how God first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. So what I take from this is Peter meant that before there was a Jewish nation, God talked to Abraham, who was a Gentile at that point, to create a nation under him. So, you know, Abraham was a Gentile, uh, even when there was a Jewish nation. So they all agreed uh, in that council that the Gentiles are also covered by the gospel. And what was said in Amos 9-11 uh, was true. Uh, Amos is also a book in the Old Testament, so they were saying, they're affirming that what it says was true, which is, after this I will return and I will build the dwelling of David, which is fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up that the rest of men may seek the Lord and all of the Gentiles who are called by my name. The second point that John Piper gave is uh, Isaiah 9-7 which says, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. So the Lord's government has no end. So it's not just limited to the Jewish nation. It's available for everyone. In Revelations 11.15, it says, the kingdom of the Lord has become, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord. So John Piper said it didn't just say the kingdom of the Jewish nation. It's the kingdom of the world, so everyone is included. And its fourth point was in Revelations 7, 9. It explicit, explicitly says that the subject of the king will not only be Jews, but the people from every tongue, every tribe, every nation. So to close, we have shown that Jesus is actively reigning at the right hand of his Father. And he is just waiting for us to make a choice if we want to join his kingdom or we want to make men or our own selfish desire to be our ruler. Let's remember that the choice has everlasting consequence. We will either spend eternity suffering in hell or reigning with him. And he even made it easy for us to follow him. Because of his death, he paid for our sins. And because of his resurrection, he conquered death for us. So all we have to do is accept him as our Lord and Savior. So for anyone here who wants to make that decision, I'm sure the pastors and leadership of the church can, talk, can discuss it more and talk to you later. For those who's uh, joining us online, you can just send us a note and we'll, we'll connect with you and, and uh, discuss this.
poor. It also does not hurt that our king is the same one who personally created us and knows every hair on our head, as said in Luke 12. Of course, for me, there's less and less hair as I age. So we will not just be one of his subjects. He wants a personal, one-on-one relationship with us. He's also the one who asked us to lay our burdens on him and promised to provide us all of our needs. So if you don't realize it, we have a heavenly connection. We are connected. To those who have surrendered their lives to Christ, I ask you to persevere in being faithful to him, even if the world makes it more and more difficult. Strive in being successful in the mission your king has given you to spread the word that the righteous, benevolent, and loving king is ready to take anyone back as part of his kingdom. Let us remember that in the end, his kingdom will be the one victorious. Let us pray. Our most gracious and loving God, Lord, again, uh, We'd like to express our gratitude, Lord, for giving us your son, Lord, as our Lord.